The National Institutes of Health estimates there are 12.5% American adults that experience a phobia. Mike Oglesby is a coach who helps people conquer their fear. We all have it. Fear of failure, fear of poverty, fear of speaking, fear of writing, debilitating fear that can cripple a person into depression and self-destruction. Ogilvy's Maximized Mind program comes with receipts. His system has empowered people to step into their fear, find their truth, and create a better quality of life. Besides coaching, he speaks and has appeared on ABC and several media programs, magazines, and publications. His clients have said they are thankful beyond words that he helped them gain clarity in every aspect of their business, helped them dramatically decrease their stress, and overcome the hurdles that were holding them back. Oglesby is the author of two books and certified in the art of hypnotherapy. Please welcome Mike Oglesby. Thank you so much, Debbie. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward to our time together, sharing and learning and just having a good time. So thank you very much. You're welcome. So fear of writing, fear of speaking, fear of engagement, break down fear for us. Yeah, fear is a funny thing. Fear is one of those primary forces, if you will, of life. We all experience it. In fact, I call it a philosophy of fear, a culture of fear, really, that we've all been conditioned into. I mean, think about it. From the time you're a small child, and we do this with our own kids because we pass this down, but if your child or while you were a child, you start getting into something that your parents or your environment perceived as dangerous, like, oh, don't do that. You start climbing on the monkey bars and like, oh, be careful, you might fall. And so throughout life, these fears and these worries are implanted in us. Not only that, the way that it affects our psyche, our self-esteem, this philosophy of fear is really based on this idea that we are somehow inadequate to handle the things that come our way in life when you really think about it. And so that takes a turn and starts to affect our psyche and how we think about ourselves, what we believe about ourselves in this world. I mean, I think a lot of people, maybe most people believe this world is a dangerous place, but the world itself is not a dangerous place. There's danger in the world, but that danger is expressed by us. I've thought about this many, many times because I think about these things quite often. And I think there's these, what we call these evils in the world. We say, oh, there's a lot of evil in the world. Now, think about this. Imagine this. Take all the human race off of the surface of the earth. Are you left with evil? No, you're not left with anything but nature, natural instinct, the process of natural evolution. The evil comes from ourselves. We express these things in the world. We take these fears and then we overcompensate and we become destructive. We overcompensate for these ideas of fear and things that might happen or have happened that we don't want to happen again. So we really live based on this fear principle, this philosophy of fear that we've been taught since we were very small children. And we propel those cycles as we grow older. A lot of people think that their beliefs systems and them change as we grow older, but they don't. They stay the same. We just express them differently. And so we're really caught up when we talk about anxieties and depressions and a lot of the mental illnesses and a lot of the struggles that people have are based on a philosophy of fear and this idea that we're somehow inadequate to handle life and what it brings to us. So fear is a very big deal. It's something we all kind of live by and try to run from and hide from. But I really try to teach people uh, how to embrace fear since it is one of the primary forces on this earth that kind of governs our system and humanity. There's a lot that we can gain from that. Fears can help us. Fears can yeah. do a lot for us. And so I try to teach people how to embrace that and step into it so they can grow and outgrow these issues that they experience in their life. So what are some of the physical and mental repercussions from someone being in that consistent state of fear? For example, even in like, especially 
in a war zone, we see what's going on in Ukraine and there's constant fear and dread. And you can even get that if you're in an abusive relationship. When you look at these aspects, I know like it's two different things, like in a theater war or abusive relationship, but either one, you don't really talk about it. You don't share it with the outside world. My father never said one word about what it was like to serve in the war. And he talked about shore leave and all the good stuff, fun stuff, but never what was like on the ship. We hear that when people live with constant fear and dread. What does that do to the body and to the mind if you keep ignoring it? Well, that's a great question. The ultimate price that we pay for these things that we allow to build up and cultivate in us through a lifetime is death. If you think about the number one cause of death, it's stress. Now, stress will manifest itself in many different ways. And let's be clear, stress itself is not a physical thing. Stress is a mental thing that becomes an emotional thing, that becomes a physical thing, like heart attacks and strokes and things like this. A lot of that can begin with stress and the way that it impacts the body. So there is a mind-body connection, a very real one. And stress, we have two types of people in this world, essentially, in this particular model. We say, okay, we have this one type of person who takes all of their emotional traumas and their stresses and their body kind of takes the hit for that. And these people, you'll tend to see them getting hurt, spraining an ankle, passing kidney stones, things like that, having difficulty with their body. And there's another type of person who tends to harbor their emotional or mental traumas in that mental state. And what they do is they shut down, they block themselves off, they try to protect themselves from this world. Now, the problem with that particular way of expressing ourselves is when you try to shut off the world as a way of protecting yourself, you actually cause yourself more pain, more destructive habits and things like that. Again, it's just an overcompensation. So on the mental side, it can cause us to experience things like anxieties and depressions. And these are all just expressions of fear in itself. And so we can experience these debilitating aspects. And there's other mental illnesses that I think really stem from those mental traumas and that fear-based philosophy. And there's a lot of physical illnesses. Now, if you take and you look at how we have evolved as a human race, you're going to see that it, before medicines and, and traditional, what we call traditional medicine, pharmaceuticals and things like that came out to help us, there were other ways that we healed ourselves. And if you look at like the, the ancient Chinese and these different ways and practices of, of healing ourselves, we'll find that you can trace just about any physical symptom back to some mental or emotional state that when it's repeated or not taken care of, for example, when we let it sit back problem or conflict that we haven't resolved in life and we let it sit, then it can have an impact after so long on the body. And we've known this for thousands of years. This isn't a new concept. Most people haven't heard it because they're more, you know, conditioned into the style of medicine that we have now. Yeah. So it can have absolute effects mentally and physically. So there's good stress too, right? Absolutely. I mean, if you have a big meeting come up and you're just kind of, <laughs> it helps you prepare for things too, that big moment. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's sometimes hard to distinguish between excitement and anxiety. So really learning yourself and getting in touch with your body and understanding your mind and understanding human behavior and what it's all about, that can help a person first and foremost distinguish those so that they can form healthy connections in their mind with those so that it doesn't impact them in a detrimental way. Because fear itself is not a bad thing. There really is no such thing as a bad thing thing. There can be things that are bad in this particular context, but they're not so bad in this particular context. There is no absolute bad, right, wrong, things like that. These are forms of measurement based on what we've learned. And Good so to keep in mind, can, if we go through what we did when we were trying to get on this broadcast, <laughs> right, <laughs> computer, right. Our com your, the computer was spooling and <laughs> yes, and we I had an opportunity to learn. Bad stress, but <laughs> It felt bad, didn't it? It felt really bad. But now I can say I learned something, yeah. right? And so I want to be able to take that. And even if we're going through the good or the bad or 
whatever it is we go through in life, we want to be able to extract that good, extract the gifts, extract the, the things, the opportunities and possibilities that can take us into different places that we want to go in our life. I think that's really important. So how did you get into this field? What got you into it? It was interesting. I never saw myself doing office work. I never saw myself really working with people. In 2009, I started taking psychology. And while learning that, I came across an NLP, which is Neuro Linguistic Programming Practitioner course, which basically deals when you break down the word neuro. So we're talking about the brain linguistic. We're talking about the language programming, the ability to change that language and what they call that internal territory or map inside the brain, how we relate to ourselves in this world. So I started studying that and learning that, which led me into hypnosis or hypnotherapy, which is hypnosis combined with therapeutic modality. So it becomes hypnotherapy. And I found it really fascinating. So I decided to start asking some people around me if they'd let me practice. I wanted to test the limits. I wanted to see what is this really all about? Because when most people, I know like myself, who hear the word hypnosis or hypnotherapy, it's kind of like this woo type of a thing, you know, it's like this, there's a stigma around it. And what we see on TV where you could just hypnotize somebody and boom, they're just a different person. So it intrigued me and I wanted to learn more about it. So I delved into it. And I started working with these people. They would come over to my house. They'd let me practice with them. They trusted me. And it really worked out well. The people that I worked with, the bulk of them, all went to the same chiropractor, which happened to be a friend of mine. And he's like, wow, man, you're really helping these people get some good results, some weight loss and some self-esteem, things like that. And I wasn't really trying, but I was exploring. And he's like, why don't you come and set up an office inside my place? You can work with my clients. And he was connected with a cancer doctor who also invited me in to work with her clients and set up an office in her shop. So that's when Maximized Mind, hypnotherapy and coaching was birth. It was my calling. I always say it was kind of like the red carpet was laid out for me. So this system of life had a different idea for me. And I took that path almost 12 years ago now. Wow. So does hypnotism work on everybody? I imagine there's some, I would kind of have a fear of losing control while going under that influence. So how do you breach that with other people and, or does it work on everybody? So the first thing that I learned in this business is the number one job that I have is to educate people because most people are afraid because of what they've heard about it. And so it's really nothing like what most people think. It's really nothing like what most people think. Most people think they're going to be out of their body. They're going to be out of control, that they're just going to kind of disappear or something. And that would kind of give me or whoever they're working with who does the hypnosis the full control. But that is so far from the truth. Nobody can control you. You can do things like what you see on stage. That's very real. But we have to remember that those people came up out of the audience and onto that stage of their own free will. The things that they do on that stage are not things that they would typically not do in their real life, mm -hmm. but it's kind of like you always have these defense mechanisms. They keep you safe. They want to make sure that you're okay, that you're going to survive. That's what they're you're designed to do is, is protect yourself. And so even, I'll kind of put it like this. So imagine three o'clock in the morning, you're in the deepest, soundest sleep of the night and a strange noise takes place in your house. What do you do? you wake up, mm. right? You wake up immediately because your subconscious mind never sleeps and it's always on alert. It absorbs everything from the senses when those senses are active and your auditory senses and things like that are active even when you're in those lowest brainwave states, what we call sleep or deep hypnosis. So you've always got these defense mechanisms there designed to keep you safe. You're never out of control. So translate that to a hypnotherapy session. If I were to say something to someone that went against their morals or their values or was wrong for them, they're going to pop out just like that. 
right? So they have the defenses. You never lose control. This is really about giving you control. And there's a big difference between what you see on a stage and what I do. What you see on a stage is hypnosis, and that's for entertainment purposes. What I do is hypnotherapy, which is hypnosis combined with a therapeutic modality, and that's for more of a clinical setting. So I don't do a whole lot of the instant or rapid inductions, which is a very quick way to put someone under. Those will work for pretty much anyone. However, it's a consensual type of a modality, which means if, if I walk up to someone, they could be the most suggestible person in the world. But if they say, no, I don't want to be hypnotized, there's not a single thing I can do. So you never actually lose control. And so what a hypnotherapy session looks like versus a hypnosis session is I just have someone laid back in the chair, got a nice big comfortable recliner. They lay back, they put some headphones on. A lot of times they'll put an eye mask on because we want to get them out of this world and we want to go into the internal world. It's not a back and forth conversation. It's me talking to them through a microphone. I have a processor and a music studio on my computer. And so I process it and they're just listening to me talk. And a lot of times they'll either fall asleep or they'll kind of go in and out, or they'll be focused on a specific task that I give to them. So that's what a hypnotherapy session looks like. It's a very relaxing thing. It's not a scary thing, yeah. but a lot of people are scared when they first come in. They're like, well, I've never done this. But once they do it the first time, they're like, wow, that was amazing. That felt wonderful. I can't wait to do this again. So as sad as it is that I'm an Atlanta Falcons fan, you wouldn't <laughs> turn me into a Dallas Cowboys fan. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's really about helping a person get in touch with who they want to be and take those most powerful resources they have, the most powerful strengths that they have within themselves, pulling them to the forefront and letting that be their guide as they start changing their life and moving in the different positions that they're looking to move into. Give us an example of how hypnotism works. Uh, what is it that clicks in them that when they wake up or when they come out of the session that they feel better? Like, does it like get rid of your phobia immediately or is it just gives you the tool that you need to work on to help get rid of that phobia so it's not typical for a person to wake up from hypnosis and all of a sudden boom it's gone you know there's an idea that people have with hypnosis that it's like a magic pill I'll give you an example. I had a guy I was working at, he was mid forties. He loved working out. He was avid about going to the gym. He was a big guy. And so he told me one day, he said, Mike, you know, I thought I was just going to be able to come in here and you were going to hypnotize me and everything was just going to be different for me. I said, well, think about it like this. I said, imagine taking steroids, but never going to the gym. Like there would be some alterations, but you're really not going to get much effect from that. You still got to go in the gym and work out. And so that's very, very important. And something I always stress to people that I'm trying to educate and help is that you have to do the work. There is no magic pill and changing your life can be difficult. And it's not because change is difficult. We often say, oh, changing your life is difficult. It's really not. Not the change part. That's not what we struggle with. We struggle with letting go of the things that we're so attached to. I read a quote on Facebook once. It said, before you try to heal someone, make sure they're willing to let go of what's making them sick. And most people are not willing to let go of what's making them sick. Mm -hmm. They often say, everybody wants their life to change in some way or another. Everybody. It doesn't matter how together you've got it, how much you've succeeded. It doesn't matter how accomplished you are. None of that. Everybody wants their life to change in some way. But most people are unwilling to change their life. This is where the conscious mind comes in. That's why I do hypnotherapy and coaching, because it's necessary. Your conscious mind has your greatest superpower. And that is your choice, right? So I can hypnotize a person. I could put all the suggestions in there that I could conjure up and they could be the most powerful suggestions in the world, but they can wake up and they can talk themselves right out of it, just like that because they have choice. They have free will. So I don't really actually have any power. I'm just helping to connect people to their own power. 
understanding that is essential because it's not just going to happen. And I think that it's important for people to know that change is a process and it's not something that, you know, it's not a one and done. It takes time for change because change is a psychological process, but it's also a biological process of reinforcement. You have to reinforce the change for a minimum of three months. That's a minimum to create new neural pathways in the brain. And that's what change is. It's a process of growing new neural pathways in the brain. That process alone is at least three months. But it depends on what you're working on. If you're working on self-esteem and you've got self-esteem issues from when you were a child, which is when they typically come in, that's when you learn who you are and who you are in relation to the world, you're going to have to work until that work is done. And that can take years to do. And so hypnotherapy allows us to kind of fast track that, right? But it doesn't allow us to like get it just like that. It takes time. So hypnotherapy, how does that come into the process and assist? So if we're just working with our conscious mind, we have to first understand what is change psychologically? What are we actually trying to accomplish? And this is really the key to understanding why we use hypnotherapy and what it's all about. So your whole life, everyone's life, anyone's life is an expression of their belief systems. I call them programs, right? And these are the things that you've learned as you were growing up as a child. So you learned what this world is as a child. And that doesn't change. Those fundamental belief systems, they don't change as you grow. And a lot of people think they do, but they don't. It's kind of like that saying, time heals all. Time doesn't heal a single thing. If it did, then why are there so many sick, older, bitter people out there in the world? They would be the most healthy people, right? But they're not because time doesn't heal. Time's not a, a real thing. It's a concept we use to measure things, right? But time can be experienced in many different ways. Time itself does not heal. It's our job to heal. So healing is a matter of going into the subconscious, working with the belief systems that are propelling these perceptions. And then of course, it comes into the consciousness through the thought, which stimulate emotion, which drive action and produce results. So hypnotherapy allows us to go to the very core of that, which is the belief systems. So that's how we utilize hypnotherapy is to install new ideas to affect the belief systems that are propelling the cycles in our lives. You can't help everybody. So is this why you started your podcast? Ah, uh, yes. So the podcast was to create a broader reach and actually to help me create a platform, which I'm starting to branch out onto now. What I'm really doing is I've been doing this one-on-one -on -one coaching for about 12 years now. And I'm looking to reach a much bigger audience. So I have a book that's going to be coming out a little bit later this year based on fear and how I've utilized certain structures and modalities and constructs to help clients over the years overcome those fears, whether it be anxieties or depressions or whatever kind of fear. Fear has many, many faces. Almost all debilitations stem from fear in some form or fashion. And so really giving a structure and, and starting to teach people on a on a bigger level is really what I started the podcast for, to branch out, to create a greater awareness so that I could step out and teach the masses rather than the one-on-ones, which I've enjoyed. Where can people find someone in their own communities for help? And can the same effect of your therapy be done or experienced in a Zoom call? Absolutely. The great thing about technology, which, you know, when it works, it's great. When it doesn't, it kind of throws everything off. In the day and age that we're in, we have technology. When we're talking about doing hypnosis or coaching or helping person, a person become more effective in their life or change directions or create change, whatever it is, we're just talking about communication. So whether a person's in here in the office or not doesn't really matter because we can still accomplish that goal. COVID changed the dynamics of how we interact with each other. Most of my clients or a lot of them, I've never even met in person. We can reach out anywhere in the world as long as there's not a language barrier and we can interact and create that change because you can learn from anything. One of the most important things and factors that I believe and seeking someone to help. A lot of people, I think we've been conditioned just to go down to our local therapist office. And there's a lot of them. 
but that's not always the direction we want to go. We want to do some research. We want to make sure that the person we choose is the right fit. Now, I learned a long time ago Thank in my business. <laughs> yes, it has to be the right fit. Look, there is not a one size fits all. I learned a long time ago in my business, I'm not meant to serve everybody in this world. I turn more people away than I take. And the reason for that is because I want people to use their resources in the best and most effective way that they can. And if I'm not the best resource for them, I certainly do not want to hang on to them and rob them of the opportunity that they could have to further or advance their life or career, whatever it is they're trying to advance. So you have to work with people that... You feel a connection and you know it, you're going to get a feel for them. And I think that's one of the most important parts is going on a journey with someone that you trust, someone that you believe in, someone that you feel connected to and that you feel can relate to you. Otherwise, you're really going to lessen your chance of really being successful in that program. Yeah, you have to feel like you're being heard. Absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah. what is one thing people can do today to minimize their stress levels and walk into their own fear? Oh, that's a great question. I have found one of the most effective things that we can do is write down our stuff. You see, when we're trying to figure all this stuff out in our head, we're viewing it from a subjective perspective, which means we're looking through all those lenses of everything that's happened to us in the past and all those connections and we're applying it. In other words, we're projecting our baggage onto our current conditions or our current situations or circumstances. And we want to treat a lot of the things that we go through independently. Because if we don't, we're going to limit ourselves to what we learned about it in the past. And we want to free ourselves from that. And that really takes a high level of responsibility to start changing those stories in our head. When we can write our stuff down, we can step into more of an objective viewpoint. But we must be able to you know, or be willing really to let go of that. And here's an example. Have you ever noticed how easy it is to help other people? <laughs> right? It's so easy to give good advice to other people, right? And most people are like, oh, I give great advice. I just don't take it myself. Well, that's because you're viewing their situation or what they're going through. You're viewing that from an objective standpoint. You're not tied to that. You don't have your own stories wrapped up into that. And they can't see beyond their own stories to see the whole picture. But you can come in as an outsider Look at their story and say, oh, well, no, here, try this and this and this. It's like you can see the whole picture very clearly. Now, imagine if you could do that for yourself. And so writing things down will allow us to, you know, get all that stuff out. Write down your fears, write down your emotions, write down your thoughts, get it all out. Just word vomit, right? Become open, become vulnerable. Just allow yourself to surrender and get everything out. Just become an open book. Pour it out on paper. Don't worry about somebody reading it or finding these things out. You can burn it afterwards. You can protect yourself if that's what you want to do. Get it all out until you got nothing left inside of you. No thoughts, no emotions, no feelings, nothing. And then take a deep breath and go back and read it and ask yourself this one simple question. What is the truth? Now, I teach about truth. Now, when I teach about truth, I'm not talking about an individual truth. I teach about the universal law of truth. There are certain laws that govern the system of life that are immutable, right? They don't change. They're the same for all of us. For example, here's a truth that exists for every single living person on this earth. I am resilient, can get through anything that comes my way. I always have. And we know that's the truth because if there was a single thing that they didn't get through, they would not be here. So if they're here, They've been able to get through every single thing, maybe not the way that they want, but they were able to get through it somehow. So when you can view it from that perspective and say, okay, whatever truth I come up with would apply to anyone else in this situation as well. 
right? Because we tend to downsize ourselves and validate ourselves and, and pretend that, oh, well, you know what, they're worthy for it, but I'm not really worthy for it, right? So apply it to yourself the way you would apply it to someone else. That will give you a very effective, objective perspective that you can then hang on to that. Because once you put it on the outside of you, there's something cool that really happens. First, you start seeing that most of those things that you're going through are based on lies. They're based on lies, things that aren't even true. But then when you take an objective perspective and you look at it through the lens of truth, well, once you see the lie and once you see the truth, you can't unsee it. And so one of the cool things is we're not going to walk around thinking of ourselves as liars. We all want to know that we have integrity. When you see the truth and you see the lie, it's going to be really difficult to believe the lie again. And that process alone can create instant change in your subconscious mind, in your belief systems. And so that's a very powerful thing that someone can do right off the bat. Wow. Thank you so much, Mike. It was wonderful to have you on the show. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. I enjoyed it. Enjoyed talking with you. Thank you so much. Thank you.